All right, so we're good. You want to set that to? Yeah. Um, you know, it's actually in the closet, or it's in the closet, or ask Nicole. All right. How are you guys doing? It's nice to see people. I know. Sorry, you have to see me behind the mask, but it's nice to see people, so. I'll do this when I do my little coffee thing. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, I know that voice in those eyes. I get that. Yeah. I was just telling her how we said we had never met in person until the other day. So it's just a very odd time. I know. It's a very odd time. So here's what this is intended to be. This is a this is a listing workshop. This is not a class. I'm if I start talking too much, you guys are going to tell me to shut up because that's not what this is about today. This is this was an exercise to take the knowledge that you have now and start to apply it, right? Start to put it in motion and see, you know, for yourself. Also, hear where everybody's at and what people do, get new ideas. But it's also for yourself. I want you to be able to execute, right? You get that person on the phone. They say, come tomorrow. Then I came in here yesterday flying around because somebody called her at 6 o'clock at night. She had a presentation at noon the next day. You got to be ready to do that in any market, right? So, and you don't want to have to give up an opportunity because you're not ready to do that. There's no reason why you guys can't be there. So this exercise is an intention to really walk through the process from a standpoint. And I, I see you all pulling out stuff, so that's good because otherwise, you know, I, you need to be prepared, right? I wanted you to show up. The mandate today was to show up like you would show up to a listing. Like this is the house at 49 Cleveland Street. And Gail and I are the owners. We've called you in today to, to, to go through this process. What I wanna walk through in the workshop are the, really the components that I see to this whole piece, okay? So that starts with the, the conversation. We have an opportunity. What's that conversation I have? So we're gonna give you an opportunity to ask some questions. So we wanna see what kind of questions you would ask given that opportunity. Then we'll talk about prep and research. You know, where are we getting our information from? What did you go out and do? I want to hear. I want to hear what you guys actually did. I want to hear what you know about this property. All I did was give you an address, right? You should, you have enough tools as an agent. You really, 99% of the time, you should be able to have an address. I didn't even, I didn't give you the conversation, but even without a conversation, I should give you an address. You should be able to walk in with a lot of material. To, to be able to present right off the bat, even if you didn't have an opportunity to talk to them. Because that's where listings are won, right? So prep and research, we'll talk about, I wanna talk about the materials and deliverables. I wanna talk about what you showed up here with today. What does that look like? Where can we get better? What other things might be available that you're missing? But I wanna see sort of where you came in. Then what is it at at the house, right? I'm, I'm at that house, what does that look like? What, what are your intentions? What are you gonna do? What are, what's the conversations you want to have? How do you want to present those materials? We're going to walk through that. And then the close in the contract. Am I missing anything on it that would be helpful for you guys? Does this make sense today? Is this what you signed up for? Okay. All right. So again, uh, this is not going on the internet. So this isn't being shared with other people. So, but I want you to playful out. That's the intention today. This is about practice. This is about execution. So the value today doesn't come from just sitting back and listening. The value today for you when you walk out of here is going to come from the, the talking and going through the steps with us and learning. We're not expecting, although it'd be fabulous if we're there, we're not expecting perfection. This is why we're doing this now. So you're not practicing in front of the home seller for that first time you go in, because that's what a lot of times you end up getting stuck doing. We've done these in the past quite successfully. And I'll tell you the value, uh, the real value that's gonna come out of this for you that we hope is that two things happen. One, your confidence level goes up. You now know and understand you can execute. You feel good about the materials you have, right? And you also, we now relay that in your appointment setting, you'll find there's a correlation between your confidence level and how many appointments you put on the calendar. Because no matter how hard we try, if our heart's not really in it, or we don't feel like we can really do the job we want to do, then we're not having the right conversations. We're not pushing people into the right piece to get that appointment. That's the reality of it, right? Okay? Yes. Everybody's in? Yes. 
Okay. So, and just because we have masks on, just speak up. Hopefully I'm doing that, but it is hard to hear some folks behind the mask. So I want you to start with the conversation opportunity. So this is the address you had. You know, somebody gave you a lead. You're going to call. Who wants to start a conversation? Go ahead, Nate. Uh, one of the questions that I would ask is why do you believe your listing expired? Why do you believe your home didn't sell? Good question, Nate. So, you know, we put it, we put on the market, we saw some stuff that was on the market. We really thought we could get, um, you know, that we could get the 700,000 for the house. So, you know, we, we put it on. I, I don't know that there was anything in particular. We liked our agent. Um, you know, we didn't really, we didn't notice anything in particular, it actually seems kind of strange to us that it didn't go under contract. Would you lean more towards the pricing or the marketing? That may be a reason. Uh, well, because I'm a homeowner, I'd probably say marketing, right? Right. Right. So look okay. at some of the pictures, and the pictures I don't think do the home industry justice. Based okay. On the other oh, interesting. List, okay. Listings that kind of went on in that neighborhood. Okay. Especially in the neighborhood where the house the home value is pretty high. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I yeah. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Are you finished? Okay. No, I don't know if that's how we're doing. Yeah, we're just very interactive. This is this is. I'm on the phone. You guys are having an opportunity to ask questions. So. Yeah. No. The other, just piggybacking off of that, the other thing I would ask is, um, how was the traffic? You know, when you did show it, and had open houses, and you know, did you get a lot of people in? Um, did you have any offers on the house? Good. Good question. Yeah. So, and so, what do you what do you um, that's a good question. I'll answer that for you. But so we didn't have as much traffic as we expected, right? Um, and uh, we never, we heard there were offers coming in. We never actually got an offer. Now, yeah. So what do you, so what do you think? What do you, what is she trying to flush out with that? What, let's, I mean, we're going to talk about these things and I want to dissect them a little bit so you kind of know what's the value in that? Yeah, she's flushing out the experience. Nate's already kind of alluded in, in is kind of setting you up for, hey, look, dude, you tried to price this too high, right? You lost the market. But but I'm not going to just take that at that face value, right? So we've got to find the history. Well, what did happen? How much traffic did you have? So that we kind of know, and it helps her answer the question, was it truly price or marketed? Because if I say, God, we got a ton of traffic. And I don't know, we just couldn't seem to get it under contract. Well, then it might be more the marketing, right? Or it might be a bad agent that didn't do the right communication, right? Or follow up or whatever came out of that. Based on the answer that you kind of gave, you said, well, we didn't have that much traffic at the open house. Mm -hmm. I think if we just said that, yeah. we'd probably be more exposure and more marketing. Right. Well, both. Price, too, right? Price, if it's the wrong price, I'm not bringing people in, right? So it's that could be a both in that scenario. So correct me if I'm wrong. Was it 49 Cleveland Road or Street? Street. Oh. Did you do the wrong property? I did road. Oh, that's okay. You're, you're fine. Huh? Road. No, it's road. It's oh, road. it's road. Sorry, you're right. It's road. It's road. So, when, when it's road. I wrote stream here. The, the reason why it, that's why it's road. Be, because when you were saying that, when you were saying that you didn't Street. get a, you didn't get a, um, you didn't get an offer. Mm -hmm. I thought I seen through MLS of one one ten that did go on the agreement. It actually sold right. It, it, yeah, it sold a little bit later. Yeah, March third. Okay. Yeah. Okay, good. So we're gonna get. We'll go back to that with the front yeah, ones. Yeah. You're, I'm good. I'm. I'm excited. I'm excited. What I'm hearing. This is good. This is what I'm expecting to hear. What other questions are helpful for you at this point? I mean, when when I did see it go under agreement, I wanted to know. Um... Well, so no, assume it didn't go under agreement okay, because okay. It, what this is is an expired opportunity. Okay. okay so it, it did. It happened to sell since I gave you the exercise, to be honest with you. Yeah. So it kind of sold out from underneath me is what happened. So I want you to pretend like that didn't happen, but there's some, there's going to be some value in that for me and you coming out of this. So, but, so just assume it didn't sell, you know, it. you looked it up on the computer, you're smart enough to look it up on the computer when somebody told you about the address. So you looked at the pictures, you started to look at things. What else would you like to know to help you prep before you get off the phone with me? What are some of the motivations for selling? Yeah, where am I going? What are you doing, right? We, we um, you know, we're not in a rush, but now that it didn't sell, we're kind of getting a little antsy that we really do want to get out this year. You know, we'd like to take advantage of the spring market and not go through all of this year because we we do know where we're going. So, or to yeah. pull the equity out of the home. Um, do we ask the question again? Are you trying to more or less pull the equity out of the home, or are you more or less trying to move for a specific reason? 
like a new job. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna have you I know ask. That's a bad, that's a bad I know I'm gonna have you ask that question better because I don't like the way you asked the question, but I can tell you didn't like the way you asked the no, question. So <laughs> so ask me the real question. I don't know what the real question is. So why are you moving? Yeah, why, 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 where are you going and, and why are you moving? Why is this important to you in timing? Now, in addition to that, you asked another question in there that I think I'd like to ask more in terms of, do you need to sell to buy? Okay. You know, do you already have something lined up where you're going or do you need to sell to buy? Do you need the cash coming out of this transaction to, to move forward into another transaction, right? Because that also speaks to my motivation and timing, right? Okay, good question so far. What else you got? I have another question because um, I've been taking Connie's class and then one mm -hmm. of the questions she's uh, try, she's having us uh, be aware of is, is there anything that the buyer's agent might see as a problem? And when you get people talking, they will tell you. Okay. And yep. I would ask you this question. Yep. So, I, see so I like where you're going with that. I'm going to give you a little structure around that, just more so from um the psychology of people if you will okay because that's another piece of this right it's like we want the data but we want to ask questions in the right way where we're already starting to actually build the relationship with that person we're going to be meeting in front of right, right? because this is a very that's a very important piece of this conversation that we're going to have so i think before i go down that road which is a good road i would start with tell me what improvements you've done since you've been in the property i see you bought the house back in x based on what i looked at tell me what are some of the improvements that you've done Maybe since you bought the house, but more specifically, even since you had it listed, because it wasn't, it was listed last year, right? And with COVID, they may have done some improvements. They may have changed some things because there were some, there were some things done in this house and there were some things not done in this house, right? When you look at the pictures, did you catch that? Like some of the kitchen looks brand new. It's all pretty. And you start to look at some of the other pictures. You're like, yeah, it's not completely updated. Not everything's completely updated, right? So what have you done for improvements? What follows up with that on the backside is what kind of, and I, this is again, just a better way I like to phrase it. What improvements would you want to make if you stayed in the property? So what kind of projects are on your list or were projects that you would do if you were, were to stay in the property? Okay. When you go in, you're gonna take the buyer's eyes look, right? And kind of see through the buyer's eyes, what kind of things stand out, what, where my, my opportunity might be to improve. Good. Any other thing else? Yeah, I was also wondering. Um, I know that you had priced it, um, where you priced it at seven thirty eight, mm -hmm. eighty. Um, at any point, did you consider dropping the price when it when it wasn't when nothing was happening? Or did you, did you like... um, the agent was trying to get us to do that, but we were we weren't really ready to do that. Do you have a a number in your mind that is a you know, hard stop? So, um, so good question. I like that question, and I, and I'm gonna I'm gonna back in that just with a little comment. Don't be afraid to be bold and ask questions like that because again, there's data and value in that, right? Because she needs to know coming in, am I talking them off the 738 ledge, or are they already more reasonable and I don't have to worry about that when I come in, right? How much how much data am I gonna have to bring to the table to get them there? So she's saving herself a lot of aggravation and work. Okay. Um, uh, we've started to understand based on what we're seeing in the in the area in the neighborhood that we probably were too high. Okay. I don't know where that means we would be. I'm hope, we're hoping you can help us with that, but we probably were too high. Yeah, the agent kept saying that, and it that seems to be maybe what what happened. Obviously, we'd love to get the money, and you know the market seems better now, so maybe that would happen again. But right. Well, at that point, oh sorry, go ahead. Okay. Are we still using like a cold call phone conversation? Yeah, like yeah. We're in a phone conversation, yeah. So in a phone conversation, you ask what kind of improvement they do? Like, would that be like this? So yeah, so here's the here's the value in that, Timothy, that before I have eyes on the property, I because I'll be able to go look at pictures of the property online, right? But if I look at pictures and they, this particular case, they're pictures from last year. So that that's why I picked this property for you guys. So you could ask, have you made any improvements since last year? But that way you can really do the research and be ready with the comps. If you walk in and you think this is a 1950s house and all of a sudden within the last year, they put a new kitchen, new baths, new, your comps aren't right, right? You're gonna have to scramble on the spot. So the more questions you ask up front about that, the better prepared you can go in. Okay, good questions. Other questions? 
Yep, she kind of she kind of went along that. Where do you where do you think you want to be for pricing? Which I kind of said I don't really know that. We 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 were too high. If, if when you were talking about the pricing, if you're giving the uh, information, I guess up front that you thought the pricing was too high. Would you ask them if that was necessarily their pricing or the agent's pricing? I don't really care. It doesn't really matter. Yeah. Yeah. I don't really care. I mean, ultimately pricing really is always about the person, right? Where they want to be. Um, you, you, it's important. You've asked good questions about, don't go to the don't agent. Go, go, yeah, don't go to the specific. agent, go to the experience. Yeah, specific, yeah. So is there specifically something you thought could have been done better? You know, did you feel like, you know, do you feel like it was marketing a price? Like don't go to the agent piece, try to keep the agent out of that conversation and go more to the experience, you know? Um, you know, I have sometimes said to people, <clears throat> what do you, what, you know, what did you, what, you know, what did you like about the last time? What do you think worked about the last time it was listed? Didn't want a contract, but you know, what, what, what were you happy with? Right. That's a potential. I don't know in this case I would, because, you know, it was probably overpriced. This picture issues is a bunch of things I can see right off the bat. Right. So I don't need to flush that out. I'm going to be able to differentiate myself when I sit across the table from them. Right. Right. What else? What else would be helpful to know? Um, when you bought the when you bought the property, what was that experience like? How did they receive the property from the last time? When did these people buy the property? Um, I think 2014. Yeah, 2014. Um, so, are you concerned about their experience? I'm going to keep. I'm going to push you a little bit on this because it's actually a better question for, from a value. Again. I want you to think of every question you're asking me as the homeowner on that phone as two pieces. What value am I getting as an agent so that I can be better armed going in, right? And what questions can I ask that are going to build a better relationship and trust before I go in? Right? Those are the two motivations in this conversation. So you're on the right path. You're right there. I can, I can, I can see the words coming through the mask. I can see them. <laughs> I can feel them in your brain. Um, this is a simple question. Why did you buy this house when you bought the house? Yeah. Because what does that tell me? I've always asked that sitting across the table from people or on the phone from people. What does that always? What does that give me as an agent? It tells you what they like about the property and what lifestyle they bought. The restaurants, this is the location. Yeah, the it, it, it's the highlights. I actually used to ask that question because it was my highlight phrase on the brochure. Excellent location, walking distance to town, or fabulous neighborhood, or easy commuting location, or great open living space. Or that was actually my headline typically for that property. If that's why they bought it, that's a very high probability why the next person's buying it, right? That's the primo selling points. Now everybody's a little bit different, but but it's going to give you some good ideas, right? So how would you phrase that question again? So when you bought this property, why was it you bought this property? What was it about this property that made it so special? What, what do you like most? Living here? Or what do you like most about living in the property? Yep, same thing. Yep. Maybe you know what do you, what do you hope buyer you know people that are coming in you know will will see or you know not see yep. but what you want them to take away. Yeah. yeah, what yeah, it's kind of like the highlight reel, right? Yeah, yeah. Like I've I've said to some people, if I was gonna make a movie trail on your house, what would you want me to make sure I included? Well, we would want the family room and the kitchen included, and the fact that it's in this neighborhood near the restaurants, and it's a you know, whatever, whatever that looks like. Good. What else? Anything else you'd like to know? Yeah, you haven't asked for the appointment. Oh. <laughs> That's a good one. You haven't asked for the appointment. Absolutely. When would you like to come in? How about Tuesday night at five o'clock? Right? Good one. I was. I thought we were going to miss that one. So bravo, bravo. I thought you're going to move on and go. We just have the appointment, don't we? I didn't. I didn't know we need the appointment. What else might be helpful to know? There's still a few little pieces in there, maybe, that you could still dig out of me. I don't know if we talked about their timing. Your timing. About why we talked, yeah, we kind of did. I think I don't know if we were specific, but yeah, where are you going and yeah. what, what's the timing look like? Yeah, motivation. Any any issues with the home? We talked about that. We talked about what projects. 
What oh. projects would you do if you stayed, right? That kind of flushes out that piece. Well, I, mean more I don't want to go too negative on a house, right, with somebody, because that's not about relationship building. Okay. And, but but that does I tell me. More or less like if there's like a, a some sort of issue that has to be fixed. Yeah, again, that's what projects would you do. That'll tend to flush that out. Well, you know, we really need a new roof oh, if okay. we stay long term. Or we would like to update the kitchen if we stayed. Or we would, you know, that kind of gives you just an idea of things they're thinking about that potentially the buyers would say. They're not going to say things like, uh, we're structurally sinking and we need to, right? You're going to have <laughs> yeah, to see that when you get there. But but they will typically talk about the project. And it's a good way to sort of know, you know, condition, what, what, what might be the issue with the buyer? So from a pricing standpoint. Or I don't know, maybe if you're asking the way, is there anything that you think needs to be done that you would want to do before you put the house on the market? Like just to yep. get an idea of you know, whether you're willing to, whether you're willing to paint or yep. whatever. Yeah, that's a good, yeah, you can, you can loop that into the, you know, are there any projects you want to do before you put on the market and or if you were going to stay? That you would do here's the piece though you don't want to set up and i want you to ask the question i'm not saying don't ask the question but you don't want to set up that they're going to have a long to-do list to go on the market because we don't want to scare them right out of the gate right either but but if they say well you know we really think we're going to need to put a fresh coat of paint before we put on you can come on with that painter right now you can have a painter and maybe you call your painter friend and say hey you got time next week i have a possible job so when you walk into the listing appointment you can say you know, I know, I know one of the things you said you wanted to do before I list your house, right, assumptive close, we're going to do a lot of that today, um, was get it painted. And by the way, I did reach out to my painter, Patrick, and he's available next week. You want to get on the calendar, right? Now I'm coming from value, right? And that's what you're looking for. Where can I show up and really come from value? Where can I make this easy for them? And where can I get them the results that they're looking for? Anything else you'd like to know? Yeah, I think we we I think we flushed that out on the front end. Yep, motivation, timing, right? Are you you need to sell to buy? Where are you gonna go? I don't know if this is the time work, but you if you work on building the the relationship, you can somehow suggest that you if you are gonna help them sell this house, they might think of you when they trying to buy that house. That other right, person, you're gonna they right are trying to yeah. upsize. Yeah, if so, you if that's so helpful. Right, so that's helpful for you to know, do they need to sell to buy, that's right? And, and when you come in, you'll be able to position yourself as that person that's gonna help line all that up, yeah. right? Exactly, exactly, that, that helps you come from value. Them. Be that person that they you know, trust and yeah. they trust the brand that you yeah. associate yourself with. So they, oh, I have somebody already. So they, yeah, they look someone else. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, whatever would, questions we get you there. I would probably ask if you have any questions and Are you prepared to do that? If I just gave you the opportunity and you just picked up the phone to call me? I Typically, I was calling you. There you go. Yeah. Okay. So well, no, I mean so I have yeah. a lot here, yeah. but yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, yes and no. Okay. okay. Now, no, it's a good. It's a. It's a good comment. I will give you a word of caution. You want to balance between um, establishing relationship and asking really good questions and not talking yourself out of an appointment. Yeah. And, and you, you walk the line of giving too much information up front or overwhelming them too much up front where they don't go forward with the appointment. Mm -hmm. Because the real value is always face to face. The minute I get face to face with you, I have a much easier chance of having a really good conversation, reading body language, looking at the property, really getting you into that contract, right? So I don't know that I'd go down the road too much on, on that piece. And honestly, for most people, that's part of the conversation they intend you to come in to have, correct? Right, of what, what the market's doing. But, but you know, you could ask, you know, have you been out there looking at other properties in the market recently to see where the things have changed over the last six months? Because I'm, I'm happy to go through that when I come out to kind of show you why, how it's different from when you were on the market last time, right? On that on that component how long of a phone conversation would this be if you had to ask the like the few questions that you need to know how long of a conversation yeah. it like, is it going to be like a seven minute 15 yeah. 20 minutes maybe mm -hmm. depending on how talkative somebody is and how mm -hmm. and obviously the little more talkative they are and i it also is going to depend like Alyssa was saying 
I'm not going to take the opportunity and run to the phone. I'm going to get on my computer and look up the house a little bit and see, well, what's the deal with that? And okay, so it was expired so that I can ask good questions, right? If I hadn't done that and somebody gave me the lead, I'd be just calling and saying, oh, why are you selling? You know, when are you ready to put in the market? I wouldn't even know what the history was. And so potentially I'm going to ask better questions if I've done a little research. So there's no right or wrong. There's no right or wrong. It's going to, but they might be cutting you short because look, I'll see you Tuesday. I got to go, right? And so that's fine too. Your job is to just try to get as much as you can so you can be as prepped as possible and, and start to build that good connection. Anybody want to know who your competition is? That'd be nice. So yeah, I mean, if depending on where the lead came from, right? You you know, you might say, you know, I'm looking forward to seeing you on Tuesday. I would also like to, you know, am I the only agent you're bringing in? Or now, some people are afraid of that question because they say, well, it sets up that question. But if somebody responds, well, no, we were just bringing in you. Why should we? No, no, that's fine. I'm the one that's going to get your house sold. I just like to know, you know, I, I do like to set it up and, and make sure I, you know, know what where we're at in the process. So, but it's important to know because I'll tell you right now, there's people out there. Used to be the day of, you know, it was either just you or it was three people. I heard one the other day. They brought seven agents in, which I'm sorry, but that was stupid. That's like data overload. Like there's no reason to do that kind of interviewing. Apparently, they had too much time on their hands now that they're working at home in COVID. They felt like they just wanted to bring a bunch of agents in. All right, anything else you want to know? Was the other agent, um, so this is closer to the communication, responsive. Uh, was he available later than 5 p.m., for example? Okay, so I think you walked in after the conversation, okay. So, but which is okay. I would stay away from the other agent because it has a negative connotation to it. And you don't necessarily know my relationship with that other agent. So I'm, I'm you know, I think we'd asked a question of was there anything you would maybe could have been better, or do you, you know, do you want to do what how was that experience? Look at it more from the experience than from the agent piece. When you're in the house and I'm having a conversation and I'm walking around with you, I might have a better opportunity to get into specifics. Like, and I again I would word it differently. I would word it from a is there a way that I can better serve you? this time around from the last time you had it listed, right? So now it's about you taking responsibility and not, right? You always have, you gotta be a little careful with language and sales. Little things like that can make a big difference with, wait, you're just attacking the other person or are you really trying to help me, right? And again, it's dangerous ground because you don't know how, maybe that's their cousin, maybe that's their mother and they just don't want their mother to list it because it didn't work, right? So if you start going down that road too fast, you're gonna shut that trust door too fast. I ran into someone that looked me up and said, you are a new agent. Yes. And my response was, well, right now, a very experienced agent is very busy, and I will dedicate more time for you, because I'm not as busy probably as the other agent. 7 p.m., 8 p.m., 10 p.m., I said, most likely the busy agent that has some this and one half the time that I would have, and dedicate more time to you and you know, full energy. Okay, but am I concerned as a homeowner with time or experience? Right, so. Uh, right, just answer the question. So the question mark was experience. Yeah, yeah. So be, so again, in, in, I like the, I used to use it, so I, I like the piece of it, but I wouldn't do it necessarily even over the phone, but I, you know, I like the piece of, and I did say this to a couple of people, I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'm a big fish in a little, or I'm a little fish in a big pond, or do you want the big fish in a little pond, right? And I would go down that path at the time. So there's value in that. But be careful of just jumping to that because you haven't answered the ex experience question. Right? So you need to address the question before I can talk about that. The way to address that question is to bring experience to the table with you. So if you're, if you're, in if your integrity because you're new is being raised to question, diverting the question just makes that a bigger problem. Okay? The way to divert that is to bring the experience with you. I understand that. And yes, I'm new to real estate, but this is the experience I'm bringing into the business. Or yes, I understand that, but I actually work as part of a team with agents that are over 20, 30 years in the business. I do. I, I can be your 20 year plus team member. I have been in many instances, right? When Moore and Benna were new, that I was, I was the team member. I don't go in, but I was the consultant team member, right? That I work with. And that's enough of a support that we can get past and really address the credibility issue because that, be careful not to address the actual question, right? Um, 
So if that's good info, and you got to say that, but just make sure you don't say that first. I did. I did struggle. I wanted to bring up a number yep. of how much we generated in our offices uh, last year. Yep. I didn't have that number, so I kind of got yep. the stuck here. Yeah, where are those numbers, by the way? That's a good question. Can we run MLS. It on the MLS through the... You don't even have to. Go into the go into BerkshireHathawayResources.com. Go into the Commonwealth Connection tile. Go into the Agent Library. And there's a section uh, in the Agent Library under... I knew this the other day. It won't take you long to find it. It's Commonwealth by the Numbers. In fact, two of them, they're printed out on the file cabinets over by the copy machine. There's two sheets. One of them is like we have number three in MLS, how many agents and offices we have, and then it has our production and numbers. And it's good to have those in your in your toolbox. You know, on top of your mind, how many offices have around? Is it 28 or? Is uh, it's actually 30 Paul? something because of the Robert Paul. Robert Paul. It was 27, and I think we're 38 now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Good. You have good. You have good data to go do the next step. You feel good about your appointment? Okay, all right, so let's move on to prep and research. Small is pricing workshop. <laughs> right, we got right, right, huh? It was hard with this one. It was very hard with this one, it's why I picked it. <laughs> it's why I picked it, right? They're not all easy. Some of them are no brainers. I'll tell you part of why it was hard with this one. Uh, there's, there, I'll tell you why so you understand the backstory, but there's two components that make this hard. One is the fact that it's a case and it's square footage, right? That's an audit, oddity in and of itself. Um, the other thing that's actually making it hard is the market. The market right now makes this spreadsheet, it's almost like you're trying to, you're trying to walk across very uh, unstable ground, right? Typical markets are a little, they might be going up, they might be going down, but they're not doing it at quite the speed. We're kind of doing this right now, right? We're kind of all over the place. So there is a little bit of that that flushes out some of these spreadsheets too, but. Okay, so we did a spreadsheet, so we're going to talk about that in a minute. What else did you do? Um, put together the oh, okay, yeah, but what did you do to prep and we'll talk about materials. Oh. Let's talk about prep and research. What did, where did you do? Tell me your actions. Where did you go? So you obviously got data because you guys have some facts. <laughs> huh? So you went to MLS, you found the old MLS listing, so you know it was expired, right? So this property was expired back at the end of December, correct? And it was listed for? 738880 So somebody asked a question, did you price it or did the agent price it? What would you guess in this case? Yeah, why? Because of the numbers, yeah. That's, a, that's an agent that's got a numbers thing going on. If you looked at their history, they probably have a lot of 80s just because of a number thing for them. Just just a thing. People have a thing sometimes. We had, we, like we, like a trademark. we had an agent. I, it's, I don't know. I, I don't know if they were trying to stand out or if they were just trying to be different. We had an agent in Westford that used to do that. It was like 767 or some odd weird number. Was all, You always knew it was her listing if it had that number on it. It was just a weird. It's like, what? Like, where did that? In fact, I actually got a listing one day from her. No, true story. True story, because I said to the people, I can appreciate that she gave you that number, but I know she gave you that number with a 767 or whatever it was at the end. And I'm going to put a 999 on it and get you a couple extra bucks. And so that might make a difference. And, and they're like, yeah, that actually makes sense. I mean, how stupid is that, right? I mean, that's so ridiculous. But so you have to be careful what you do that it doesn't bite you in the behind on part of it. So where did you go to do your research? You went to MLS, you looked, you found it expired. What else did you do? You went to... RPR, okay, you ran an RPR on it, okay, so that was getting into the comparables, right? What about finding out about the property? I just did, um, I listed up the property um, on the public records off the MLS. Right, public records, right? Great data off the public records. Um, that's, something, that's something I would always typically have in my folder when I went on site, right? Not so much to have the data in front of me because I would have already utilized it, but to show them that I did my research. Right. And what was the other thing you just said, Nate? Assessor database for Right. What you know, are the facts correct? Are the facts correct that are on the public record? All I did was Google, you know, Waltham uh, the address assessor's record, Waltham, it goes right in, pulled the assessor's field card. Because one of the questions I actually had on the property, because if you really dove in a little bit on the research, was 
What was the actual square footage? Why was I asking that question? 235 per square foot. No, not how much per square foot, but the actual square footage of the house. I was asking a question, was the house 2763 square feet or 2364? Why was I asking that question? 2763. Livable, uh, it's matching the, the assessor's. Uh, Where did I get the other number from? I got the other number from somewhere. When you get it from a public record, from the MLS. Okay, so there actually was no square footage on the assessor's record, which is unusual. But there was actually, unless, did you find it? I didn't find it on here. I could not find the square footage on there. I think it was left up. But why did I, where did I get that other number from? Why do I have another number than you guys? From uh, Registry of Deeds, maybe? You could look up the deed? You could look up the deed. I didn't actually do that, but you could, you could have looked up the deed. The deed doesn't actually have square footage of the house on it. Right, right. Deed doesn't have square footage of the house. But I, I have another, I had a conflicting record that had 2364 on it. You guys are gonna have to dig deeper next time. Mm -hmm. The last time it sold, it was listed as 2364 square feet. I actually looked at the old record from when they bought the house. And so then I started to question, why was the square footage different? Because that can make a big difference, right? When I'm doing the pricing. Did, did the, when you go back and do an MLS search, I just go all the way back. I don't just do the last one. So I do like back to 1900 and see what comes up. And so I actually could see the, the history in the trail and when they actually bought it. They might have, but again, one of the things I would be concerned with when it's overpriced like that, did the agent pull a random number that wasn't true, right? And now is pricing based on a 20, almost 2,800 square foot house versus a 2,400 square foot house. That's a big, that's a big issue I need to know about, isn't it? Like I, I've got to figure that out. That has happened to me. With yeah, I got to figure that out because that could be the big pricing issue. It also could be why this spreadsheet got so wonky. This house might not actually be almost 2,800 square feet. The assessor's record has a uh, layout floor plan piece of it. So you probably could calculate, but what it didn't have, which I was kind of surprised is I thought the Waltham records were pretty weak actually. Usually you're gonna get better data. It had the base drawing so I could figure out the square footage, but it didn't have that second level. And because it's a cape, it's not a, like a colonial would be easy because if I got 1,100 here, I got 1,100 here typically or close to, but a cape is different because of dormers and stuff. So. It, it, I really actually couldn't even calculate it from this. Can you just tell me how you get to that? Yeah. I Googled Waltham assessors or either Waltham assessors records or Waltham property field cards, field property cards. When you go to Waltham assessors, it will probably yeah. pull, it will pull you right up to uh, the page and then there should be a tab. It took, me, yeah, it took me two seconds when I went into it. It is a weird tab up at the top where you do the search. Well, this happens a lot with finished basements. The discrepancies. Yeah. Number one, I guess the confusion is if back in the day there was heat, the amount of the gross area yeah. and the livable area. Some agents assume, for example, if the garage or the basement was heated, it was considered yeah. a livable yeah. space. Yeah. And I guess that's what you know a lot of these mistakes happen or they were miscalculated. Yeah. Yeah, so in, in this particular case, when I was starting to do my research, I would have wanted to ask the seller, I didn't see anything online, but do you have finished space in the basement? Because maybe that is about 400 square feet and maybe that is the discrepancy. And the reality is if 400 of that 2763 is in the basement, that does affect my pricing, right? So that would be helpful to have that information ahead of time or know so I can start to adjust it. Because it's subterranean, it's not technically part of the living room. So it's not about, so in our MLS now, which is different than it used to be, you have a field indicator that you can say, does the living square footage included in the basement is it included, okay? Here's the, here's the psychology of this behind my thinking. You have to be careful when you list the house to know what the competition is doing. And if so, if it's in an area where everybody's listing the finished basements because that's what everybody has, then you're gonna wanna do that and just put the field in. But, but if I'm a buyer, if you go back to the psychology of this transaction, if I'm a buyer and I tell you, I want a house that's like a 2,800 square foot house. And I walk into a house that's 2,400 square feet with 800, 400 in the basement, I'm not getting a 2,800 square foot house, right? That, that's where it starts to throw things off. And it can really throw it off when I'm up against the competition. Because if I walk into a true 2,800 square foot house upstairs, and now I walk into your house, your house feels small to me because that extra square footage is in the basement. So you have value 
for a finished basement, but not at the same price per square foot yeah. as you're going to get on your regular living levels. That's that's kind of what you were saying with the subterranean yeah. stuff. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Just don't want to get into. I have one property up in New Hampshire that I'm bringing on. Yeah. That, uh, the last one that sold didn't have a finished basement, but we do. So I'm trying to make sure that I price it appropriately. Yeah. Good. Okay, so um, prep research, anything else? Anybody do anything different? Anybody drive by? Anybody do? I, I almost did, yeah, I almost did. I, yeah, okay, but that's a, that's a, you know, you have a listing, a big, big listing opportunity, and you're trying to really prep, and you don't know the area. You're going to try to do that. What could I do if I can't drive by? Google Earth it. Yeah, Google Map it. Go in and take a few. What's What's the street look like for this? Does, can anybody tell me? Yeah, good guess. <laughs> Sorry, I'm calling you out on that one. Because I, I can tell the way you say it that you're guessing maybe, but no. I actually found a little bit. There's a ton of families. They're fairly diverse. There's several parks. Um, there's a small movie theater. There's a lot of dogs and walking trails in the area. Give the girl a clap. And so that's some serious neighborhood research, right? Okay. Um, just be careful with the diversity piece. Again, don't bring those kind of things into the conversation with this place from a fair housing standpoint. I appreciate that, but don't bring that into the conversation. Um, the other thing is just, you know, Google Earth it. This is a beautiful little tree-lined street full of beautiful capes. It's, it's like, you know, I'm not going to use that term, but it looks like your typical kind of family neighborhood, right? I'm not going to say that because, again, I don't want to cross that line. Typical single family. Tree line street, beautiful tree line street. <laughs> Let's go with that. Let's go with tree line street. <laughs> so have to be so careful these days, right? But it's important to know that, right? Because if this is on the main road overhanging 128 versus in a little neighborhood with trees, that affects my value a lot, right? And it affects my, my saleability a lot. Anything else that you did or that you're concerned about? Right. Yeah. So do, you know, when you're diving in, we haven't dove into the comps, but when you're diving into the comps, you know, are you really comparing apples to apples? Um, you know, and again, I say this all the time, but I say this just to remind you, and this is the importance of looking at Google Earth. You know, there are things like water towers and railroad tracks and highways and power plants and things that you can't necessarily see from a quick search that immensely affect the value of a property. Um, next to a graveyard, right? I mean, there's there's a lot next to an industrial building. There's a lot of things that can it can look like the most fabulous house, and your quick sweep of the street would look like it's such a great setting. But yet, there's you know, I sold one in Littleton years ago, and I always laugh because people are like, oh, you're so underpriced that. And then when they showed up the house, like, oh, the train when the train came through, it was literally in the backyard, like the house shook, right? So it affected the value. It was a beautiful house. <laughs> And it needed to be brand new to sell, and it did sell, but it's not going to sell at the same thing that house sold three streets down where it was away from the train, right? So you have to you have to try to you have to try to get your handle on as much of that as you can before you walk in, so you don't have any surprises. Can I just ask you two questions? Yeah. About the, um, the square footage. I just I pulled this up just while we were talking, and I see on this twenty seven sixty three. So where did you? See where are you seeing that? Mind you, go into the tools. The last record. The, the last sale record I found the 2364. Oh, it's the sale. Record. It was the last sale record, the last time it was an MLS. So it wasn't the assessment. I didn't find anything to support the 2364 today. Okay, got it. Right. Good question. All right, you good? You feel like you've had good conversations, you've set up the opportunity, you've got you feel pretty comfortable about your data? You feel comfortable with the research? You guys came you came on, but I appreciate that. I like the knowledge you came in with. Bonus points over here for knowing so much about parks and all that stuff. That's even 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 a, a notch up, right? Because then you can play that up into the lifestyle of, of how you're gonna sell that. So let's talk materials and deliverables. Tell me what you showed up with today. I actually brought the disclosure card first. If, we, if we're gonna go meet them, I'm gonna show them the... Ah. She's getting a double gold star today. This girl is trained so well, and I haven't talked to her in forever. That's from the bonus class, yeah. She started with the mandatory agency disclosure form. Thank you, dear Lord, that's fabulous. 
Excellent, excellent. Now, and here's another piece to add to that to make it easier for yourself, especially when you're new. That could have been incorporated into the conversation ahead of time, right? Mr. And Mrs. Seller, by the way, before I come out and we start to talk about real estate, there is a contract in Massachusetts, it's not, not a contract. There is a disclosure form in Massachusetts that I need to have you sign before we talk about real estate. And just so I don't forget when I show up at the house, I'm gonna email that over to you now to sign. What have I actually set up with that? They're signing. I got their emails. I got the loop set up. I got the, I'm ready to go. Yeah. Right. I'm going to have the offer ready. I'm going to have the listing agreement ready to go. I'm ready to go. And I've got them signing paperwork for me already. And I've actually done what the state has mandated and I need to do. Now there's a bonus to this. If you are up against competition, how many agents do you think do it this way? In, in, real, in reality, in the market today, how many agents do you think do it this way? Everybody should. Everybody should is the answer. But it's very uncommon. And I will tell you, I did this all the time as an agent because I used to teach ethics back when I was an agent. So I kind of, you know, I'm a rule follower. I like to follow the rules. But I also learned very quickly that it differentiated me from the other agents right out of the gate. Because they would say, well, the other agent didn't ask me to sign a form. I'm sorry that happened because it's actually state law. So I'm just going to send this over again. It's not a contract. It's just a disclosure. So I've already actually, I've already actually raised a question against my competition, haven't I? Before they even walked in the door. In a nice little subtle roundabout, yeah. you know, way without, without being negative. It's a diff where we, you have to look at when you have a listing opportunity or an opportunity with a client, any opportunity or any option to be different, to stand out, to show them that you're above what they've got with these other agents is gonna be so critical. And this is just one little perfect example of that. That takes the edge off of you as a new agent, not having to work it out. And it differentiates you right off the gate. Now, if those other agents go in before you and they come and go without that form, you know, I, you because the reality is when we talk about that form, you know, well, Mr. Mr. They said, geez, we had two other agents and they never even put the form in front of us. I used to say, well, I hope you really didn't share any confidential, confidential, confidential information with them because that's actually the purpose of this form to set up our relationship so that even if you decide you don't want to work with me, I can't use any of the information I've learned from our conversations against you in the transaction. So I hope you didn't share anything with them, right? I mean, Bye-bye. See you later. Leave them in the dust. You're a professional. You know what you're doing. You know the laws. You're following the, the right way to do business, right? I have a question as it pertains to that, because that's now I'm going to implement that for sure. That's the best way to do it. But with using that with some of the buyers and some of the like yeah. quick conversations that I've had, I start to plug them into dot loop. Yeah. Do I necessarily want to give them that right away if they might be like a year away or a year or two sure. away from sure the minute? So the, the, the obligation under the law is that you haven't signed at your first face-to-face -face meeting where you're discussing real estate. But it doesn't say it, ha it has to be by then, right? So if I don't, I can do it now through email as long as we have that relationship continued. And it, it's a, like, if I have you sign it as a buyer and you buy a year from now, I can still use that agency disclosure form. Okay. I don't have to have you resign it because that's actually the correct way to use it. Okay, right. okay? yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Right. Yeah, good question. Yeah, I think that's that's all you have to do. You just you have to present it. And if they don't want to sign it, that's fine. You can continue to go on with the relationship. The, the law is that you present it and explain it. I have found really, I've never had anybody check the bottom because I've always said, this is not a contract. It says right on the top, this is not a contract. It is really just a disclosure statement to identify how we are working together, what that relationship is. And just so it's clear. And the state thinks that that's important enough that we do that. So that's all this form does. And then if there's hesitation, I'd say, and by the way, if, if you're hesitant, just check the bottom and I'll take the form back and we'll go forward. That's all, you know, you fulfilled your obligation as long as you pre presented it and had that conversation at the right time. Okay, good.
Bravo. Let's go back on to the materials and deliverables. That was an added bonus today. Well done. And raise your name. Okay, so let's talk. I want to talk bigger pictures before I start to break down the components. I want you to tell me individually, maybe even because I think there'll be there'll be value in this exercise. What did you show up with today? Because I told you to show up like you were showing up to a listing appointment. Okay, so you have from where? Okay. Toolkit CMA. Found? Laptop. Okay. Digital? Okay. Digital. Okay. Anybody bring it found? Well, I would have. Okay, okay, that's okay. I, I, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. I printed it on double sided black and white. <laughs> okay, that's fine. Thank you for saving that. That works. I know. I saw you print it up the other day. Normally it goes in a nice furniture halfway. Paper bound, um, right. So, yeah. So, bring the folder. Huh? I keep it the seller's guide to selling. Okay. And then I put in a uh, sample brochure. Okay. So, we're back, let's back up for a minute. Let's talk about the buyer seller brochures that we have here because I saw a few people looking like, what is she so talking about? Guide to selling a home in Massachusetts. Yep. So, those are available in all the offices. They're available digitally, they're available print, but again, it's just a nice little tool. It looks yeah. nice. It's a professionally done, right? It's, huh? That's a, that's a nice thing you could send digitally ahead of time, right? There's another piece we didn't talk about here. So, you know, you guys did a toolkit CMA. Did you do, you did the full listing presentation. Did anybody think to do uh, the, the pre-sale with the CMA only? I was going to do the CMA only, but it felt more like we're doing a listing proposal without getting a whole listing yep. proposal yep. and then go through. Yeah. Okay. So just so you know, this there are two choices here. You can do it as a, you don't would never do just a CMA only. You would do a, a, the, what's called the pre-listing in there with the CMA. And that would be because you were going to get them the pre-listing package either digitally or drop off the hard copy to them before you went. And so that they could see, because that's everything but the comps. So it's about the company. It's about the marketing. It's about you so that they could look at that ahead of time. That's an acceptable option the pre-listing, and then you would bring the CMA with you to do the comps when you showed up at the appointment. The other option is to do the full listing presentation, which includes both of those components and have that conversation when you're, when you're in front of them. So you would find both of those things? Sure. Or send the pre-listing digitally if somebody's more conscious or you're not going to have time to get out there. Uh, someone once said to me, that, so there's no right or wrong to this. It's style, personal style, but also client read. So my personal style falls to bring the one document. I'm a, I'm a, you know, most of you figured this out. I'm a get it done kind of girl, get out the door, get the contract signed, right? So, but every once in a while in those phone conversations, you can tell by the way somebody's talking to you and they're more analytical and they're a little bit of a slower processor. I would actually get a pre-listing package out to them because I could sense this is a person that needs to look through the data. Most people I'm talking to don't care. This person's going to want to analyze that package I give them. So I'm going to send that out to them ahead of time so that by the time I sit down in front of them, they're at least partially prepped with me. Okay. That's why we're doing this. This is, this, but this is so you can, when you're having those conversations, you, you, you know, again, we talk about this in the class, but when you're really applying it now, this is where sort of the rubber meets the road, right? You, you don't, you're diving in, you're looking at the actual property, you're looking at the actual comps, right? Okay, so now the other piece Alyssa talked about was a completed brochure, a sample brochure. Did anybody else bring a sample brochure? That you should have sample marketing materials. You should have brochures. You could have, um, you know, potential samples of postcards, things. We have a whole file cabinet with some sample stuff in it. Nicole and or your admin can easily take an existing brochure and do something up with your name on it and even do a couple of different properties that nobody's going to go digging in. You're not going to leave that behind, but there's going to be an assumption that you've had some marketing and listen, the top agents have that in their files. So you need to have it too. You need to show them the quality of the work you're going to bring to the table for them. Okay. Yep. So they can, they can do that with some sample stuff so that you can build those up. Um, this isn't the case, but if this was a luxury, you would want the tiered marketing stuff with you. Right. And there are samples for the tiered marketing in there as well. With the, um, the, the sample of the marketing material, at this point, would you be giving them a 
sample of what the MLS sheet would look like, or would you be giving that to them probably like right before you order less? So say before you list instead of that proposal. Yeah, you, so I would. I will. I'm not going to worry about the MLS at the proposal because that's what everybody okay. sees. Yeah. Um, and to be and to be honest with you, there's very they're out there, but there's very few people that are going to say to you, "We want to see the MLS before you hit post." You're going to get some highly analytical, critical, detail-oriented people that might say, "We want to see your description. We want to see your pictures before you post them." Ninety-nine. 99% of the people, that, that's your job. They're expecting you to come up with the marketing materials and the, and, the, and the level of, you know, expertise that's going to get out there. They're not going to care. They might have a comment about it after, but they're not going to right. typically think to ask for you to see that ahead of time. Because I've just heard a couple of times over the last week, you know, if you were to do this printout of, of MLS, a sample of what it's going to look like on MLS and have them sign off on it. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. I, I don't, yeah. I don't, I don't know that you're hitting the client's real need there. Yeah. Now, what I might do in this case, because it was listed not that long ago, and I, you know, I would have brought with me the old MLS listing so that I can check the facts. So let me check a couple of things that I see on here from the other, you know, and then also it's going to make it easier when you take the contract to go forward. So you have gas heat, it's two zones, you know, we talked about, and, and you, you know, you've already looked at the pictures in the description, I hope at that point. So when you come in, right. Well, I'm jumping ahead. I'm, I don't want to give something away there. Sorry. I'm going to stop. Oh, he loves when I just start talking, right? I don't stop. I always say in these workshops, I'm not going to talk. And I always go home with a sore throat. I don't know what that is. Huh? It's only decaf. I never drink caffeine. Okay. What else do you have? What did you bring with you? Um, so... They only like sell maybe like buy like one once they like twice you know maybe not as much but if somebody would ask me I think the really the attorney is very important so be like here you go or a list of any other people that can help them you know contractors yep. or yeah I'd be like I have it here for you I can call them for you excellent yeah. I have a team of vendors available by the way that are going to make this transaction so much smoother for you obviously if you have your own attorney you'd like to use but if not. I've got a couple of recommendations I can happily share with you that are going to make your life so much easier in this, right? Also, when we go back to the conversation we had, right, this is where I have the opportunity to show up if they say, geez, I would really, I, we would really love to get painted or we really have to organize the house or, you know, we need to try to get rid of some trash or, you know, I would do the research before I walked in the door to say, by the way, I can get the painter out here next week. I can get, you know, you, you would get that all lined up, right? Good. Excellent. So, I have a whole team of vendors, whether that's a list or whether that's a couple of brochures that I have handy. I also include it. Oh, sorry. No, no, no. I, I, I print out, well, I do this because this is what they want to me. Yep. Um, all, of the, um, all of the documents that would be in that list, so the lead, um, paint form, yeah. the contract. Um, you have, so you have a full contracts package available. Right. So I, yep. this way, you know, they can see it, even though they might do it electronically. Yep. They can just have it. Yep. So again, Ben, it goes back five years with me. So Ben, I learned, learned, it goes back to me. I always, even to this day, even with the digital, you want to go in with contracts filled out. Now that can be digitally, that can be printed out like that. And maybe like you said, a copy just so they can see them. But especially as a new agent, but to this day, I still do it. I always pre-fill out that contract with as much as I can, and I go in with those documents ready to put right in front of them to sign. If you're so, pre-filling them out, would you, you wouldn't pre-sign them? You would be doing the no, 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 you do the signatures, but I'm putting in the address and the, the book other. and page, yeah. and I'm putting in a range of dates, and I'm putting, I might leave the price out, but I'm keeping it so it's really set up. Now, that came out of, again, being a new agent, just being afraid that I wouldn't be able to fill out the forms in front of them, and I didn't want to look like an idiot, and then I quickly realized that it's actually a, it's an assumptive close. I'm showing up with your contracts ready to go. Yeah. So at the minute the opportunity presents itself at the table, I can throw them in front of you and be out of there that much faster and be that much more efficient. But again, then you don't have to fumble through the forms in front of them. If you ever get stuck, which again, I don't like to do this because if, if they're ready to sign, you want them to sign. She's got the package ready to go. So if I'm ready to sign, I'm, I'm ready to sign, right? I'm, I'm not going to then go back and say, Okay, let me send these to you digitally so you can sign them. 
you're ready to sign. I got a paper to put in front of you, right? Worst case scenario, you don't. You, you tell them, I'm, or you're fumbling because you're like, I don't know what that form is. And new agents do it with offers all the time. All right, let me go build the offer for you and I'll send it to you to sign because they're calling me to say, or, or, yeah, review the offer for me before we send it to sign, which is okay, right? But in this case, you might have that opportunity to sign right on the spot. So it okay for a person like me to try to add not a listing, a listing, um, uh, a listing, yeah. So would it be okay for me to, because that's why I ended up doing, I had the disclosure form um, and a couple of few forms, but I didn't have like the contract and everything like that. I was thinking more so like, I'll do that once I get home so I can make sure I'm, because I know it's going to take me some time. Again, you, again, that's the value in having that contract. You can do it that way. It's fine. Mm -hmm. But there is value in having that filled out, working that through with Gail and I so that really all you have to do is throw the price in it and maybe you have to cross something out and change it, but at least you have the dates and the framework set up. The other piece of that is you're not fumbling in front of them and giving them an opportunity. You know, I, I used to do a year listing contract. Well, if it's pre-filled out in the form, they don't make a big deal about it. If you're filling it out in front of them, they might say, oh, just make that for 60 days. Right, so now I've been able to sort of set up what I want and maybe they're gonna make me change it, but I, I really put what I want on the table instead of what they might be looking for, okay? Is there something online? I think Julie had mentioned it in one of the classes, but like a video, you know, a class or something that you can see how all of these forms are filled out. I, mean, I thought she said there was something on, uh, on the- I'll have to look in my library. I've had, we've done classes with that in the past. Yeah. So I'll have to look back in the library. Um, some of the working with sellers classes, we went through the forms at the end of it, but I don't know if that's the one that's out there on the recording. I'll have to find okay. if I can find one for you. Yeah. But again, either one of us, I have probably more me still because she's coming up to speed on the mass forms, but you know, I'm happy to, if you want to set it up electronically so it's easier, set the loop up, start to fill it out and say to me, hey, take a look at this loop. Where, just like we do with the offers, you know, people do that all the time. Hey, I'm going to send this offer over to my buyers, you know, I mean, I just did this the other day, right? I, I can go in very easily and look at those and say, okay, check this date, do this date before they go in. Okay. Uh, the listing paperwork's not, not as complicated as like the offers because it's just really date range, percentages, uh, price, property address. There's not a lot on there. There's not a lot on there. So it's not as complicated. Okay. Yeah, but you should, should walk out of there this week with feeling like I could fill those forms out pretty, feel pretty good about them. Anything else? What else? Do, what else do you have with you? I always bring like a separate folder with my, you know, the MLS sheet, the public record, the, um, the pricing um, worksheet. Work yep. Um, not that I can't share it. But right. Right. Um, okay. Again, um, more is better than less. I know we're in a digital age. And, um, you know, and then I appreciate you guys didn't use the buying machine and all that kind of stuff. But again, the exercise was to really go through the actions and really the, the pain of printing. I know Alyssa's done this because I just talked to do it the other day. You know, print it out, get it bound, know how to use the machine in case you have to do this on a weekend when Nicole or somebody isn't here, right? So don't be afraid to go through that activity with her and, and take a sample of when you get your first one, make sure you give yourself the time to do that. So you're not fumbling and running at the last minute for that stuff, right? So in the toolkit itself, because uh, Elio was talking about the resume, you know, what, what do you think, not I don't want to break down section by section by section, but what are kind of the important pieces of the highlights for you? Like what were you concerned with when you went into the toolkit CMA that you wanted to talk about in specific? I took out the resume section. You took it out, which is fine because you didn't have it completed. That's fine. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah. Uh, my one issue that I have with at CMA is it feels like when you're doing the comparables, there seems to be like, and I just did a, a very basic one. I just went through and said, okay, I'm gonna leave yeah. this as this and just look through it and make sure everything yeah. is fine. And then as I look through it, there's they're listing the comparables in like five different ways, but Correct. it's all the same different properties. Yeah. Correct. Um, so that's so, intentional. Yeah. So you should never be going into a true listing with everything selected. That's in the toolkit CMA. That's like the full feast. Yeah. That if you ate the whole feast, it would kill you because it's too much food. Yeah. That's like the full option to try to hit everybody's different needs. So what that does is it allows me to do different things depending on the property. Okay. So 
if I know this is a very unique, maybe this is a high end luxury waterfront property. And so I only got three or four comps that I'm going to pull in. Then I might do the one property on a page and do a map, right? To give some context to it. But this is a colonial or a cape where I might have more comps. I might do the three up property. Maybe I want to do the map because I'm not that familiar with the neighborhood. I want to be make sure I can know what's close to it, right? But again, you're not gonna not gonna do them all. Um, and then the other thing that I just wanted to clarify with you because I feel like the toolkit gives a lot of information, but I don't know if a lot of it. Would, I would just hand it to them and say, "Here, read through this while we talk through all these other yep. different parts." Um, and I just want to clarify. You said pre-listing packet and a, and the CMA could be the listing is the technical listing like uh, presentation on toolkit. They're just combined into listing presentation. Correct. They're, they're, then, yeah, the other they're, one is broken out into two pieces, which is properties only and yeah. And yeah. the CMA. Okay. Yep. Yep. Okay. So and I can't yep. present the can't present CMA only. If you're going to do CMA, you do CMA and pre-listing. You should because you're you if you do CMA only, you're not talking anything about marketing company right. value that you bring to the table. You're missing okay. a big part of why you're here at Berkshire. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, good question. So the other piece of that that goes along with this question around the toolkit CMA is there's also a lot of other pieces in there. There's relocation, there's digital marketing, there's right, there's a lot of other components in there. So I, I might not include all of that either. If these people told me that, you know, it's a it's a it's a small home, it's probably a starter house in Waltham, it's not gonna potentially be like a relocation type property and they're not leaving, I might keep all that piece up, right? I don't need to have a ton of stuff in there that doesn't apply. So you should, especially initially, once you get your toolkit framework set up with what you like, and again, you're not gonna be talking through all these things too, just keep that in mind. But what you like, once you set that framework up, that's gonna set as a default. So you won't have to go in and so much analyze it every time as maybe, okay, this client expressed an interest in the phone with, you know, or a concern with international marketing. So maybe I wanna pull that piece to their presentation to address that. But I'll have that framework so I can get out the door faster going forward. All right. Initially, if you haven't really gotten in there, you know, do them all like Nate did. Go through and read them and look at them, and then start to uncheck them and go, okay, that's because there are some of them. It's like four different ones for something. It's like it's overkill. Yeah, it's overkill. No, no. It's it's intended and set up to give you choice, to personal style and and where you want to head with that. Okay. Now I want to go back to. Deliverables. I want to go back to uh, materials in before we talk about the presentation piece because I want to move into that next. Anything else? You brought the brochure. Anything else? Okay, so another piece. We talked about this, and so this is one piece you missed. Photos were not that great on this property. So I would want to be prepared to show them how I can do better. Right, we've got stuff from Carrie Howell floating around the office. In fact, this one right here, they were all over the place. <laughs> I didn't even have to work hard to find it, see? I didn't even set that up. And, but she's got stuff where she talks about her photography and she can send you like before and afters or tips, right? So that you might say, I, I work with this amazing professional photographer and I wanna show you, you know, this is the difference of what that's gonna look like. Or you might set up, um, and this is actually easier than you think it's gonna be, I've sometimes found old listings in there that were before, like they were listed and expired and then they relisted with a new agent and the pictures are so dramatic. I'll put like a before and after and say like a before and after on a little sheet. And, you know, this is why photography is better, you know, professional photography is better kind of thing. So I would be prepared with something like that in my sort of portfolio, okay? I would want to, and you might not all have this right out of the gate, but I would want some kind of resume, right? So. Um, Connie has a class, actually one of her 13 modules is building that resume, but if, before you get to that, you know, start to think about, you, yes, you are new to real estate, but you come to the table with skills, right? Real estate requires marketing, it requires sales, it requires negotiating, it requires organization, it requires so many components that can be pulled into that with your resume. So it's okay to, you know, Benna has been in real estate five years. It still says on her resume, Deloitte and Touche, with, you know, she was a consultant because that adds value to who she is as an agent, right? So figure out those things that you might want to share. Doesn't mean you put your actual resume in its highlights, right? In your, in your expertise or where you feel like, you know, I'm more creative or this is, the, this is an example of how I'm different online, or, you know, right? You want to 
your next step walking out of here, and, I'm, and it's okay that you're not there today, but I want you to get there sooner than later is, how do I differentiate myself now? How do I show up like that experienced agent that has newspaper clippings and brochures and stuff like that? I want to get as much of that together for me as I can. So like we have Boston Magazine ads in the library or in my or in the office, right? That you can have pieces of, these are some samples of some digital print, uh, digital uh, no, printing advertising we do, or maybe you have some examples of digital advertising, right? You want to just give them a flavor, okay? No, and I'm okay to leave the nine years of UPS on there to use for like area knowledge. Yeah, strong, yeah. That would probably, okay. Yeah. I have it on there, I'm just like, mm -hmm. About yeah, it shows it shows reliability. It shows you know the area really well. It shows you know dependability. It shows there's all kinds of pieces in there, right? Yeah. And again, pick out what I want you to specifically pick out more than the UPS piece is the skills. What are, what are the skills that you have? And you all got hired. I think you all got hired by me in this room. So you all got hired for a reason. There's skill set in there. Timothy brings a very strong financial background that he brings to the table, right? That all plays into who you are as an agent. And especially until you have more experience, he's got some sales under his belt, so he can now talk about that, right? You have to, you have to stand up against that with your experience. So for example, someone like a Benner or more, I know for a fact Benner does is she, she actually brings in, these are some of the recent listing, these are two pages of my recent sales because she has that now, right? That's part of her resume. Well, you don't have that, but you have it as an office or a company. You could easily pull that together so that you can stand out, right? So this is this is me taking you up a notch here, guys. This is getting off. This is getting you up so you're on the same playing field as that experienced agent that you're sitting across. So you can feel confident about those materials you have. What about um, references? And yeah, perfect. Yeah. Perhaps, like, or testimonials from the testimonials, testimonials go a long way and they can be embedded into the presentation in different spots. But if we don't have any business yet, where are we getting them from? Well, so you might have testimonials from other, you know, other people you've worked with in the past, okay. other client type relationships. Somebody like you, I might have Benna write a testimonial. It doesn't, she doesn't have to say that she's a real estate agent, but she knows how you show up and what you've been doing, right? So there's other, other ways to do that. Okay. Anything else you're missing? We got forms. We, so we got toolkit CMA. We got backup research. We got forms. We got some marketing samples. Anything else? I think you did a pretty good job. Feel better? Okay. All right. Let's dive into that's materials deliverables. Again, high expectations. Bind it, good paper, high quality postcards, nothing, nothing done crappy. The admins can help you make sure you've got good, high quality paper, you know, good, good stuff, materials. Don't, don't wing it, please. Okay. That's why we're here. All right. So now I'm at the house. Now I, what I want to do here, because we talk about, you know, working with sellers and stuff, I, I go through really more of the pieces. I want to kind of talk about chunks, components here. And I do want to dive a little into the conversation from a bigger picture. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'm, I want to start with a basic here, though. I show up at the house. Early, five minutes. Oh, you're so well trained, Nate. Thank you. I need <laughs> I need at minimum five minutes. Five minutes early. Yeah, please be early because, again, it's not, you know, it, it's just to show you don't want to be running in late. You know, be organized with your stuff. I mean, I see like Alyssa's got a nice little bag. She came walking in today. Like, I, I literally watch. I mean, it's probably the funniest story I have in real estate. The agent that was coming out from, he was in front of me. I was coming in behind him, and he literally fell down the stairs and like all his materials flying all over the yard and everything. And I'm just sitting there looking, and the people looking at me like, oh, God, thank God he's leaving. I'm thinking, I'm done. I got this contract signed. I'm in the bag, right? I mean, but I felt so bad for the guy. And after that, I never like even carried myself in. I always went in with a, because I thought, I don't ever want to do that. I don't want to ever be spewing my stuff all over the place, right? Now, the, there's one other piece. Um, and, you know, it's not as important today because it's a little different, but you may want to have like a blank MLS form or the old MLS form so that if we're going to take the listing, we can refer to that. 
you know, we used to bring the laser gun to measure the rooms. You know, we used to bring cameras, so we were kind of ready to take the list, and we're obviously not doing that now. But you might want to, on your phone, take some what I call pre-pictures, mm -hmm. right? Just to have some things to either whether it's to help start to market it or start to right to go from there. Okay. So that's only some other tools that might be in the tool belt or in the car mm -hmm. and available. Um, and I used to actually keep a sign in my yard. I used to say to people, I could actually fill that sign in your yard right now as I walk out the door. Would you sign here? And I'll put the sign there. They're like, great. I'd throw the sign in, the little portable sign in as I went out the door and I'd say, we'll put the post in next week. You know, it's like, I mean, again, the more ready and you kind of showing up like an agent, you know, it's it's that differentiator. It's You guys brought uh, uh, laser measures with you? Laser you measures, yeah, you use the laser measures. And in this house, I might have done that because if you don't have the experience to eyeball, I could go in and eyeball a house now, whether it's 2,700 square feet, 2,800 or 24. I could tell you by walking through it. And I suspect this is closer to 24 based on the pictures, but if the pictures were that bad. But um, if you're not that comfortable with it, you might take a laser printer just to do a quick calculation out just to say, I just want to make sure my square footage is closer, or I'm going to bring the floor plan people in with the photographer to make sure we get an accurate read on that before we put your house on the market. So there's no setting up yourself for trouble. Uh, don't we base it on the on the public record? Uh, you do. I'm just I'm just making sure things are right. Make sure. If one of the options is to put a measure. So if I have a floor plan guy in, and the public record says it's 2,300 square feet, and my floor plan guy measures it out to be 27, okay. I'm going to use 27. Because that's what the house, huh? But how are you going to disclose it on the it, MLS? There's an option. It says where you get your square footage from. There's an option that says public record or measured or okay. owner. Yeah, it's it's disclosed right on the MLS. So. Okay. Um, I will. I'll be going back a little bit. I will make. I will make sure I look presentable and professional. Yeah. Um, there's a saying. I never lost a listing wearing a suit. I heard this in class. Yeah. class. Uh, so you look. You know. You look confident. You look good. You walk in. You. You know. Shake your hands because it's not yeah. hard. Hopefully. I, I think honestly. Those, all those things. And I appreciate you this for bringing up. We can't discuss it because you're independent contractors. But obviously, showing up over the part is you're never going to lose showing up over the park. Um, and I'm personally a little mortified by what I see out in the field when I'm out showing properties. I was mortified by what I saw show up with clients when I had a listing up in Salem a couple weeks ago. It just, I can't understand that. I just can't wrap my arms around that. And I think especially if you're questioning, you know, your newness and your trustability, you're, you're, you want to be that professional. You, know, you want to show them above and beyond. I'm also a very strong supporter of the name badge. It's a $30 investment, $35 investment. And it's just that professional, you know, I am a professional. I'm showing up as such, right? So that's another but excellent point. Good point. And showing up five minutes early so we don't, you know, run in the door, you know. Don't be frazzled. Shut the phone off ahead of time. Don't be yelling at the kids or the husband or the partner or the mm -hmm. five minutes before you walk in because that comes off your energy. You know, I mean, I share that in the working with sales class all the time. I had a routine. You know, my phone went off a half an hour before the listening appointment. The music went up in the car. The singing started. The neighborhood drive went on. Then I got to the house. I was in an energetic state to, to take the listing because my life was freaking frazzled. If I showed up like right out of my life, I would have looked like a basket case and I didn't want to show up that way. Right? So keep that in mind. Okay, so I, let's talk about the house pieces. This breaks into components, right? If, if you were to chunk down what that looks like when you get into the house. I show up professionally, I'm on time, I shake hands. What are you doing next? Yeah, take a tour, getting to know them, right? So introduce myself, I might, you know, say, look, I'm, I'm gonna, do you mind if we drop my stuff down? You know, let's take a quick tour of the house maybe. Right, so we, we want to do some kind of walkthrough. Again, working with sellers kind of goes through all the intricate parts of that, but there's a lot of value in that time. There's a lot of value in that time. Why? This is all about relationship. This is all about building trust. This is all about connecting to them, and it's all about getting as much information as I can. So walking around that house is about, you know, where do I see possibilities for improvement? I'm not, I'm not telling them that while I'm walking around, but I'm taking notes so I can go back to that. Right, what do I see as a buyer, as a potential buyer in the space? What could be what could be better in the space? Where where am I going to offer some tips? Right? Okay. You also get a lot of information you can tell where they're proud and yep. you know, and just talk that up and I don't know, it could be try to be yourself. Upbeat about, um, upbeat about what's going <coughs> on. You know, I think that's 
Yeah, there's might, there might be personal connection there, right? I mean, I've walked into people's houses and I've seen pictures of the kid and go, did I, co did I coach your kid in soccer? And they're like, yeah, we thought you looked familiar, right? But that takes a lot off the table, right? Or if there's tennis rackets in the corner and I play tennis, I, right? Being comfortable and having, being relaxed and having a, a connecting with them. It's going to be really important. <coughs> this is where, this is where you take that step from being so well scripted and prepared with Gail, you know, in the scripting so that you can be natural, but have good conversations with people, right? Because that, that's that level of moving into, I have, like some people will say to me, how did you just say that? I'm like, that's old scripting. That's, that's from 20 years ago when I came in this business, but it doesn't sound like it anymore. Right, because I've been in the business and I've had those conversations with people. So I'm getting good data without having to sound like I'm scripted. So you'll be working on that. So I'm gonna walk around the house and then I'm gonna go back to the table and what's the bigger picture there? What What is that gonna look like? So let me give you three scenarios. I'm gonna give you an A, B, and a C. And I'm gonna tell you what your first preference is. A is, I'm gonna say, let's sit down. I wanna to talk to you about your house. I have this wonderful presentation that I brought for you and let's take a, let me show you all about me and my company and, and your, and what I can do for your house. Okay. Option. I'm only going to give you two snares. Option B is I'm going to sit down. And I'm going to start asking questions. B. All right. This is not a person. This is not a listing presentation. We shouldn't even really call it that. It's a listing opportunity. Um, there's two areas, I believe, and Alan Dalton believes this, which he, he, he uh, verbalized very well what I've done for a lot of years, that there's two components when you're talking to the client that's all they're going to care about. And that's the marketing and the price. Those are the only components they really care about. They don't care about you. They don't care about all the other fluffy stuff we got in that presentation. That's for them to look at after the fact. The two key parts of the conversation I need to have with them is the marketing and the price. So the first question out of my mouth is, so Mr. and Mrs. Seller, where would you like to start? Would you like me to go through the marketing proposal and our plan for getting the best exposure for your property? Or would you like me to go through the, uh, the pricing strategy plan and see where we would potentially list your house when we put it on the market? And give them that choice. Okay. What is there in my language already when I started to say some of those things? I mean, it's a done deal. It's a done deal. I have the contract. Everything is an assumptive close in that conversation. I am your listing agent. And just like you, when I walk in that door, the thought in my head is this is my listing. I'm approaching it as if I'm listing this property. It's actually mine to lose. And how do I lose it? <laughs> I like that. I'm not going to repeat the words exactly because it's on video being recorded, but uh, saying too much. You know, most agents talk themselves out of a listing by saying too much, really. That's the truth. And especially when you're new, because you're so nervous that, oh my God, they're not going to know about, you know, I don't know about this and I just want to make sure they know about that. You have to think like an experienced agent and an experienced agent and a top agent is walking in and they are, they believe they have the listing. They are the go-to person in town. And so the only thing they care about is here's the pricing strategy that I'd recommend is the marketing strategy that I would recommend, you know, maybe give them some choices in that process and let's sign the contracts. That's how they would go about it. And that's how you should be going about it as well. You will look like a new agent if you start to dive too much into some, we have a fabulous relocation department. We have a, they don't care. They don't give a crap. All they care about is what they need to know. And they need to know how much money am I going to get? And how are you going to get me out of this house in the easiest, most painless path for me? Really, right? Because when you don't get a listing, and I want you to think about this because I say this a lot. And I don't, I know when the light goes on over somebody's head, I can almost see it sometimes. Somebody will call me sometimes a year later and go, oh my God, I so see that piece. When you don't get the listing, it's because the client couldn't see the path to the finish line with you. When you don't get the listing, the client can't see sitting at that closing table with you, there's obstacles in the way that you have not addressed. And so as long as you address any obstacles that they think are in that way with whether that's working with you or selling the house, it might be just even selling the house. It might be, uh, might have three kids and there's stuff everywhere. I can't see doing this, right? 
If I'm the solution to that, I'm their agent because I now gave them that path. And I can tell you in my 20 years of business, that is where 95 to 99% of the business is made because I helped people overcome obstacles and figure out how they could get to that closing table and they felt good about the money they were gonna make in that process. Okay? Potentially. So again, this is where you have the you have a vendor, you have you always have a, an idea, right? So there's probably a whole class in that. So that's a good idea. I might want to write that down. There's a whole class in sort of how do I become the solution to the listing? Because it, it, beyond like beyond the you know the pricing and that stuff, but the obstacles are in the way, right? You know, I've 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 said. And I've said things that I haven't had and I've had to go figure it out after the fact. So that's the other piece of this. I've said, look, I understand this can be really difficult. I actually have cleaning crews I work with, you know, that I can put you in touch with. They're very reasonable. We can set them up before the picture lady comes. They'll come in, clean everything. Then the picture lady will come in and we'll be good to go. They don't mind writing a check for that, but they're still going to get to the closing table, right? Wonderful. So sometimes it's, sometimes it's storage. Look, and I've got a couple of companies. We've got bins if you want to do it yourself. Or I have a great relationship with a moving company that will come in and pre-package up and move some of this stuff out, hold it in storage until you move. So you don't have to bring it in and out of the house. Do we have a list of the vendors in the office? We do. There's, yeah, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff out on the Commonwealth site, like Olympia Moving and all those. But also your office is a great resource in terms of other, there's all kinds of resources out there. I brought organizers into homes. I brought painters into homes. I brought, you know, I had a woman say to me, well, we don't, you know, we don't know how we would do the weekend open house thing. Like, you know, we've got the kids and we've got the, I said, this is what some of my clients have done in the past, you know, go to the area hotel. I actually have a, you know, I have a great contact at the local Hampton Inn Suites in Westford. I used to tell them, I have a great contact over there. I used to know the girl over there. She can set you up for the weekend. You can go over there. They can swim in the pool and play and I'll get your house sold. And then you come home on, you come home Sunday night, you'll be good to go. People like we could do that. I didn't pay the bill for them to go to the Hampton Inn Suites. I just offered them the path, right? Uh, what I was gonna say was uh, when I was here last in April was here. She was using Home Advisor. Yeah. To kind of figure out some things that she needed for a client, and she was just getting yeah. people to call her through Home Advisor. So Home Advisor yeah. is probably the best thing that you can do to just get people to get in contact with you. Yeah. You already have that whole network. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you want to be careful you don't just throw names out of people right. either because you they're going to come in right so but i've you know i found facebook sometimes i'm like okay i need a painter next week in this area like yeah. you know it's like people have some great recommendations and then i would say to the client look my guy wasn't available next week but i found this other guy who came highly recommended so I kind of set it up like okay i don't necessarily know this guy but i got i got your solution for you let's get him in let's get it painted in by the way I, you know i also had the photographer booked most times before I went into the listing appointment. If I'd had a conversation with them and I knew their timing and their motivation, and I knew they were really ready to get on the market, why wouldn't I be ready to say to you at the table? So look, part of this, part of my plan is we're going to have your floor plan done. We're going to have your photos done. You know, we're going to do the video tour. And by the way, I've got you penciled in for next Wednesday with my professional guy. You know, is that going to work? Something close. Now they got to say no to that. Right? I know you're laughing, but you'd be surprised how many people don't do that. I'm just imagining them just blown away with the status like, you know, with your jaw drop, like. Well, maybe that's why I did 10 million the first yeah, year. I don't know. Exactly. But that it's about relationship, right? We always say it. We say it, but if you act it and you really get to that and you get to that, and I know you guys get it, it's why you're here. It's getting to that, you gotta listen really good. You gotta ask good questions, you gotta listen really good because then you can be their solution. But you can only be their solution if you know what their problem is. You can't assume you know their problem. Like don't ever walk in and go, well, this is a disaster zone. I could bring a cleaning lady in here, right? I mean, now you've just insulted them. That's not gonna work. But what do you think the challenges are between if we were gonna list your house next Thursday, based on you saying you really wanted to get this on the market fast, what would you need help for me to do to get to that, to be ready for pictures on Tuesday? Right now I've set the course and I can help them get any over any obstacles before that photographer comes walking in on Tuesday. And by the way, I showed up Tuesday at picture day with Tupperware bins when I knew it was that kind of house when I was going back to. And I was like working up a sweat, running around all the rooms, throwing everything into the Tupperware bins 
so the photographer could get in there. And then I would just say to the homeowner, do you want to leave it in this for the showings? I'll put the lid on and we'll throw it in the basement? Or do you, you know, what do you want to do? Or do you want to leave it in the room for the kids to, to pull it back out? A lot of times they're like, that's great, leave it. My husband will throw it in the basement and we'll be ready for the weekend, right? Like I was the impromptu cleaning queen, <laughs> right? Yeah? yeah? What else? What else about at the house? I work up a switch is talking about this stuff. <laughs> what else about at the house? I sort of have a question because it kind of sort of pertains to what I'm going through right now with my friend from New Hampshire, mm -hmm. um, where he's very, I'm trying to bring him back down to earth. He's very excited about listing and getting the house sold, but he's still, he's not ready as far as the house has clutter in it and we want to get everything cleaned up and get us to get little touch up things here yeah. and there. How do I continue to just kind of, I gave him a list of things he needed to do in the next week. So he needed to do these things in the next two weeks or we cannot list next weekend. Do you want to be that strict? Okay, or I'm going to ask you, I'm going to put you on the spot here because that's what, that's what this is all about today, right? Because I saw Alyssa's eyes when, she, when you said this. Were you part of the solution or part of the problem with that? Trying to be part of the solution. Because I went up Okay, but were you part of the problem or part of the solution? Or was I part of the problem? What do you think? Problem. What do you think? No offense. No, there's no. This isn't about offense. This, this is one of my and this is, this is, this is, so I, I know. This, but and this is about. This is about flushing things out because yeah. sometimes you know. I mean, it's, that's not a right or a wrong, but there is a perception to what you just said. Right. Yeah. That is not really what you're intending, and I want to help clear that up for you right. because that's going to help you build stronger relationships with your clients, right? So, you thought it was a problem or solution? I it was a problem. Okay. Yeah. Don't realize what somebody else yeah. Right? Yeah. That's so be you added pressure into an already pressure situation. Okay. Yep. okay, so you were really more part of a problem than a solution. Yep. Now, let's step back and talk about a different way you might be able to do that. So we have two options here, Jim, before we go to market. Okay, we uh, Jim and Sally, whatever, whoever they're talking about. Now be careful with the friends because this is when it gets harder to do this stuff, right? So it's, I have two potential paths we take between now and next week when we list the house. One of them is that we get a couple projects done because based on that, then we might be able to get you a little more money, right? And maybe put us in a better marketing position. Here's what that list would look like. Where do you think you feel comfortable doing things and where can I help you get there? Okay, now I'm part of the solution. Yeah. Better way, better way to phrase it than right. the way I phrase it. Because I walked right. in Tuesday to do photos and I was making sure I got there early to clean up the house and I got there at 11. Photographers come in at 1.30 yeah. and I showed up and I go, I might cancel the, the photos because we're just simply not right. ready to do them. Right. So, I, so that that's that's you not having a good enough conversation at that table to prep that. Yeah. It's still going to happen occasionally. Yeah, I thought I had It's still going to happen occasionally. <laughs> but, I well, I get it. it. But, you know, and again, that's just... But that, so it is partially just how you do that. The other problem, the other thing is that we have another option is we list it as it is and we adjust the price to accommodate for that, right? So I always want to have that option on the table because there are people that can't do that. Yeah. You know, many of you have heard the story of the little old lady with the baskets that was very early on in my career that taught me that lesson very, very early on. That's why I got that listing because when I walked in and it was, filthy and there were baskets everywhere and the little old lady couldn't even get off the couch. I said, well, let's do with what we've got. I think the easiest thing to do is put it on as it is at this price. She was fine with that. And the only reason why she enlisted with her two friends was because her two friends said it needed to be cleaned. It needed to be emptied. It needed to be, and yeah, they were talking about more money, but that didn't matter to her. She couldn't do that. Right. And so that's the story I want you to remember in your head because not everybody can execute. And if you're the solution to help them when they're stuck, that's when you get the listing. Yeah. And honestly, that's what's missing in a lot of our market right now. It's always been in the space. I call them, you know, the perfect little, the, the perfect little agents. I many times have to talk my top agents off this ledge because they get so used to the perfect little house and they want everything perfect. And they go in with these very high expectations. And they start walking around going, well, this needs to be done. This needs to be done. This needs to be done. And then they call me and go, I didn't get the listing. Because you completely overwhelm them. They don't see how to do that. Right? I've got to be able to give them a path either way. 
and I got to show them that even if they're going to have to do some work, I'm there to help you. I'm working along with you. Yeah. Okay. That's a good, that's a good conversation to have. That's a real conversation to have, right? Because I had that conversation with them and I, I said, we got to do these few things to get yeah. ready and they had done, let's call it 80% of it. Yeah. And we showed up and banged out the last 20%. Yeah. But I'm just trying to make sure that I, thank God that I've known him for 20 years and he trusts me because yeah. I think if I were to go about it the way that I just said I went about it with somebody like I don't know, like in this situation, yeah. then yes, no, I wouldn't get to listen. But. Right. And even, even with the bins, I was always very careful not to offend, right? Yeah. So it's a, look, and, and you, really honestly, this is a conversation when you're sitting at the table and you're talking about the marketing piece. So here's the reality, Mr. and Mrs. Seller, you live in your house, Yeah. but I need to market a showcase. So I'm here to try to help you get to that showcase level, which isn't how we live. And so let's talk about the path to get there, right? Now it's not about you're a dirty slob and your crap's all over the floor. It's about, no, I need a showcase home, which isn't, nobody lives in that, right? Okay. And that takes the offense off the table. Even when I showed up with the bins, I'm like, look, I'm here to help but I want the pictures to be cleared and people, I don't want people to look at your stuff. I want people to look at the features of your property. And so in order to do that, I need to move some of the stuff. Would it be okay if I run around ahead of the photographer and kind of put things in the bin and then you can figure out whether you want to put them back or whether you want to keep them in the bin? Just think of me as part of your moving package, right? And people would laugh and be like, and then they typically help me out, right? Okay, you're gonna walk into all kinds of different scenarios. Is a famous, is it Gandhi? Be the solution. Like you've got to be the solution, whatever that looks like, and give them the path to that. Okay, there was something else I wanted to talk about here. Uh, oh, we get, we uh, want to go through, I'm just watching the time because we're, we, we're almost done. Um, I want to talk very quickly about the two components. Again, working with sellers, the, there's a couple of different recorded versions. So let me know if you want more than what's out there on the, on the YouTube channel, but. Um, you know, just from the, I want to talk about the pricing component, the marketing piece we've talked kind of a lot about, and you're going to get that from the toolkit CMA and feel free to walk through this individually, the presentation piece with either Gail or I to help flush out some of these materials, but from the pricing strategy piece, this is the piece I want you to be prepared with. So, you know, something happened that I did not expect to happen between when I gave you the assignment in today, and you guys flushed that out, it actually closed. It actually sold off market to somebody. So somebody, some of you look surprised. It sold off market 321.21, it closed, I think. Um, 32, 32.21 for 650. So based on what you prepared, how do you think they did? Okay, you think they did bad? I think they lost money. I mean, I think they did fine. I think they lost money. Okay. Timothy, do you have an opinion? They money. You think they're okay? No. Helio, do you have an opinion? They got 650 for the house. What? Where would you think this house was going to price? I think it probably lost about 15 grand. If they had the photographers and they advertised. Like we do the right way. Okay, so that, that's an important piece to remember with this too, right? Did it go on MLS? No. Do you think it sold with an agent? No. We don't know the answer to that. It probably did because it probably sold as an expired. Someone got creative, reached out to them, sold direct. So they probably paid a two and a half percent commission at least. Mm -hmm. Might have been, a, you know, might have been just a two and a half percent on a buy side. That somebody, a savvy buyer's agent reached out and said, you know, I, I see your house was listed. I got a very qualified buyer. You know, could we come see your house? And they took sort of that easy path. So they saved two and a half percent. So if you add the two and a half percent in, what does that put the maybe 660 ish, something like that, and figure it out right? I think they left money on the table. I think in this market, they definitely left money on the table. The, the pricing spreadsheet was a little all over the place. So it was a little hard to narrow into. But even given the comps that were out there, um, it, it's highly likely they left money on the table. Now, we don't know a lot of things. Maybe they needed to move. Maybe, you know, it's, I mean, they did okay. And obviously they're happy with it because they took it. So that's, you know, that tells you something. But it, I suspect in today's market, if I were to list this house in February or around the time they probably went under contract, 
I probably, even with a 5% commission, would have netted them more money, is what I would suspect. I think, based on the pricing stuff I did, that you probably were close to, as long as you priced it right, not list price, but they probably should have walked away with at least 675, maybe even a little higher. If you look at those pictures, they were not well taken, but the kitchen was very updated. They, better pictures would have done a better job on that house. And you would have attracted the right kind of first time home buyer or young family with the features that were in there enough in the location that I think you would have done better than that. But again, you can, you can always speculate, right? But you can't go back. I saw the two similar units last week. The one with the professional photographer. When I went in there, I was in shock. Yeah. It looked so beautiful, <laughs> like hardwood floors. And they have the virtual uh, staging. Yeah. And the other house was 300 and this was 350. Yeah. So I just went to see it. I was shocked. This house was worse than this house. Mm -hmm. But the, the photography you would never and know, the yeah. virtual staging yeah. was amazing. Yeah. yeah. So there's, it makes there's, a big there's, difference. there's value in bringing crowds in in this market right now, right? Getting five offers and driving, you know, what people are getting in their houses. Yes, it's value because it's what somebody paid, but it's inflated value because of demand because we have five offers, because we have seven offers. You or know, 31 offers. Or 31 offers on the table, right? So they did not get the advantage of that. Now, again, for them, that I'm assuming that was perfect. They didn't want to go back to market. Maybe they'd already moved on and they just wanted to sell. We don't know that backstory. But from a professional off the market topic, I would guess that if given the opportunity, we could have netted them more money if we had gone to market, even with an additional 2.5% commission. Okay. So I, I have a question because you, you're obviously the pricing report, she was kind of all over the place. And my numbers, what I got for like a range, that, are way off from the 675 number that you, you got. Yeah. So higher or lower? Higher. You guys would be higher. You, yeah. Based on the working, based on the spreadsheet, you would be higher. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So, uh, and actually, the lowest based on the spreadsheet, the lowest. Uh, and that's why I think they left money on the table because even when I said like a, you know, six seventy five, they had a shot of going over seven with this market. They really did. Uh, the lowest price per square foot I could find, if I was looking at my spreadsheet, comped it out to seven eighty two. Okay. So I mean, that's when you start to look at those kind of numbers. I was, you, you, it was almost the only other scenario. No, no, sorry. The lowest was it comped out to six eighty nine, two hundred fifty two a square foot comped out to six eighty nine. If I looked at the cake, that's what came out to 782. And again, the danger with this property, it's why I picked it, is it is a cape. I did the pricing worksheet with capes and colonials because if I just used cape, I didn't have any, I didn't have enough data to work with. Yeah, there was nothing. There was but nothing. a cape isn't as desirable as a colonial. So you have to, so that is actually why this, that's actually why this particular spreadsheet is so thrown off because it, has colonials in it, and that's what's throwing it off more than okay. anything. Yeah, so it all there was all over the place when you said yeah. 675. I'm like, why why am I this far off yeah. on the pricing? 675 was my gut before I dove in. 689 was the lowest I got okay. option of this pricing spreadsheet, which tells me again, with even with that extra two and a half percent, we definitely left some money on the table, if not a decent amount of money. Yeah. If not if potentially based on what that house is and the cute little street line street and the dog park and all the great stuff she had based on that with good photography and stuff, maybe more than that even in this market, if you if they really That's were ready to go to market. I was thinking it was closer yeah. to like 750 because I thought that the I thought the pictures were not good at all. Yeah. Um and just because just from doing the pricing worksheet and trying to get all the comps in that neighborhood. And then obviously the one cape that was on 20 Allenby or something like that. Yeah. It was on the other side of town, but there just wasn't anything in the last couple of months. So it was kind of but maybe that was part of the reason too, because I only went back two months. I didn't know if anybody went back longer than that. You need to go back longer. Well, you need to go back longer than that, and then and then recognize that actually we're in the height of that now. So no, they, they were on what six months ago they came off the market. Technically, right in December they expired out. So what's that? Three months ago, and they were at seven thirty-eight. But that was a very different market even yeah. then than we're in right now. So that might even mean that even. That I wouldn't go on the market at 738 because you've already flushed that out. Right. But 699 might have worked. You know, you don't, you know, you're not, they weren't as, at first glance, that market, it looked like it was way off and it really wasn't. Okay. 
And part of that was size and it had the new kitchen. It did have, if you really dove into the pictures, it had a couple of things like, I think it was older bathrooms, a couple of things that I'm like, okay, this has some updating, but it's not really fully updated. It's, Look it's pretty it. up. It's pretty up. And I could have done a better job with the pictures for sure. So maybe it was my range of like a couple of months why my numbers were yeah. off. That was close. Pretty Two months is tough. Months. Yeah. Usually you're going to need to go. Yeah. I usually say don't go more than six because you're out of range of reality. But at least six, so if you have a lot of data, then you might only need to go two, three months. But typically in these markets, you don't have enough data because we don't have enough inventory. I was trying to so you, you have to go, yeah, you can't, general. if you're narrowing too fast, too small, too fast, you're going to have the wrong view of the that's, process, the wrong view. That's what I did. Yeah. All right. Sorry. Okay. I have a different read on this. Okay. First with the pricing, 738, 8, 8. Uh, 880. I yep. think the price is uh, uh, owner's price. Okay. Not the agent price. But, and okay. the, because the AAA is the lucky number. Yeah. The Chinese. And it's an agent. The owner, it was an the agent. owner is Chinese. Yeah. So, and they haven't dropped a dime over almost a year. So I think it's the seller don't want to drop the price. That's why they cannot yeah. sell. Yeah. And if there's an agent, the agent can drop the price. So I think it's the owner insists. Yeah, they don't want to drop the price. Yep. That, that's a good, and actually, that is, it had been on at that price. So, regardless and, of what the seller was suggesting, the owner wasn't moving. Yeah, right. and yeah. eventually, they sold to another buyer yes. with the same last name, with a much lower price. I think it's a family member. Yeah, so that, and I did catch that. I did see that, and I wondered that. I wondered if they sold to a relative, which very well could be. It's I do. Yeah. I mean, eighty thousand yeah. dollars is lower. I think it yeah. must be yeah. related. Yeah. Without Otherwise, without trying to go to the market, yeah. then obviously either they're desperate to sell or it's something that happens to be related. Or yeah, yeah, you don't know the scenario, but those are excellent observations. I just have a question. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, go ahead. The assessed value is more than seven hundred thousand. Correct. So they sell for six fifty. So correct. The assessed value is seven hundred four, and the majority of towns sells over assessed. Right, so that it does tell you that we that, so that kind of yeah. bring me to the conclusion: yeah. the seller don't want to drop any lower the price over the year, yeah. and eventually they sell to yeah. their yeah. relatives. So, good observations. I just found with square footage, these numbers were all over the place. You know, when I started to do, because that's where I start, right? You start with square yep. footage when you're doing the printing, and I found that when I first did it, I was like crazy high. I knew something was wrong, so then I went back and I. So what I were you? What, so let's talk about what were you using for specs, though. So I, I think I went down to probably twenty five hundred, like twenty seven hundred to twenty nine hundred. Okay. But then I ended up dropping it even more. Yeah. And when I did that, and I made sure I didn't go over twenty eight hundred. Yeah. Um, things seemed to even out. Yeah. But it was still way over. What I ended up yeah. thinking it should be. So I don't know. I just. So the, again, I think the big piece, if you dive into your spreadsheet, I know if you dive into mine, that colonial factor played into mine. And, and there is big diff, there is value difference in that. Okay. There is there is definite value difference when you talk colonial to Cape, much like if you talk ranch to colonial. Okay. Colonial is at sort of the top of the category. You know, if you have a colonial, that that's why they take a lot of these kind of properties and they list it as a Cape and a colonial because they don't want to get left out of the search. It's not real. It isn't a colonial. They're trying to get away with a colonial because it's the second floor. It's a cape. And a cape tends to be small on that second floor. Um, the only the other piece of that that you mentioned, uh, Alyssa, is I did go, I actually widened my range after diving into the square footage. One, because I was concerned with that old listing of 2,300 square feet that maybe I was actually working with a smaller house, right? Potentially, but also to just make sure I wasn't pulling in enough data. But you have to be careful because I ended up going up to like 3,000 square feet and that's that's walking a fine line like yeah. that that I don't typically like to have that big of a I think your start stretch is where I would have started and I think it is where I started and I only expanded it after that because again remember the pricing workshop is about getting a range and then diving into the comps yeah. in this case uh, it the range that I got to actually was like seven high sevens was like I was coming high sevens into the eights is where my range was. But then when I dived into the comps to say, okay, how does this stand up against an $800,000 house? It didn't, right. right? And so it did help flush that out that, okay, 
it's not on the high end of that range. And that's why I started looking at, well, what's the lowest end of the, you know, what's the lowest price based on what I picked? Where would it land? I did and, almost the same thing. Yeah. She did. I put it at like 2600 but I put it up to like 32 and I was comparing all of them. Was that's a big difference. Yeah. That's and a big difference. I went back and I was like, okay. Yeah. So what were people not? Yeah, what'd you come up with for price? Oh, for actual properties? Yeah. That's a good question. What would you pick for properties? Who, who, who wants to share a couple of their comps? I would like to, but I think they're wrong now. So I'm not going to do that. Okay. Well, I don't have any cake, so that's bad. Okay, well, I have a cake. Anybody else have a cake? I have one that was, uh, but it wasn't, it wasn't anywhere near the neighborhood. What was the address? Uh, it was it was twenty. I think it started with an A. It was a whole lane, one of them. So I had I had a cape within a mile and a half. At twenty three hundred square feet at five Hemlock Terrace. Yeah, I that. And that sold twelve four. So again, I would expect that we would get better than that because of when that market was when it was out on market. Uh, it was twenty Albert Street. It's uh, under agreement. Right now, okay, and it was out on at uh 758. How big is that? 2200 square feet. What style? Yeah. yeah, I think you were, that must have been out of my range because I, I must have yeah, gone down to like 23, 24. Yeah, based on what I'm looking at here. I don't think I, I think 23 was my floor, so okay. yeah, you have to get the right style. Like, you go down as far as you like if you don't have well, the same style. so. What I would do in this scenario, which I think you all did really well, is don't think that there's just one solution, right? Like you dove in one way by square footage and then I, you know, and I did the same thing. I dove in one way by square footage and then I dived in by style and I maybe, and I looked at distance around and kind of opened that up a little bit to see, just so I had a couple of variables to, to start. You know, when you don't have a clear number, right? Then you start to draw the circles around it to see where the intersection is, okay? And so when you when it's not so clear, you have to open up that data and say, well, show me further old capes, show me smaller capes, so that if a smaller cape is 650, then I know I'm more than that, right? Mm -hmm. Just to just to what I call sniff test it, just to sort of flesh out how we how real is that, mm -hmm. right? But is the 1.5 or two miles too too far from the house? Because well, it, it, in Newton, South Newton is much better than North. Yeah, Newton. I I understand that, but within a half a mile, the only two houses I had were over a million. Right, so I mean, I had to go that distance to try to get the comp. But again, I would then, when I when I want to dive into it, I would say, is this one on Hemlock a better location, or is my subject a better location? And in this particular case, the subject's a better location, and it was a bigger house, and the pictures were better. Right, so there was there were ways for me to then quantify why that number was coming in higher. Okay, and that that's really what we're breaking down here is the pricing conversation with someone. You know, Mr. and Mrs. Sell, when you look at the market, it's hard because you're a cave and the location, it's hard to find exact comps. But if I look at your neighbor's house over here at 700,000, well, you're smaller than that. They have more square footage, right? So if you start to help them narrow into, so based on these comps, where would you want to price it, right? But your, your comps are moving in off the ranges, going up and going down to narrow in to get into that range, okay? What are the properties? Yeah, under agreement, yeah. 15 Virginia Road is sold, yeah. For the recently sold, I had uh, 115 Chafee Ave, 195 Chafee Ave, which is a million dollar house, so that doesn't count, so we take that off. And then 240 Main Street, which is a ranch. Yeah, you're not, on, you're not on my radar. You need to go back yeah. to the comp set. Yeah, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah, I, yeah I, I had Chafee on here, but that was just part of the this initial worksheet but that is definitely not a con yeah, i think i definitely the two months yeah uh, the ones if you grab one of my sheets if you want to grab them i printed them out um and again this was a little all over the place so it, it, you have to take it with a grain of salt the ones that are uh highlighted yellow all the way across were the ones that were within that one and a half mile radius and then the ones that i highlighted on the zip code are because they're in that section of town that zip code of town so just i mean just that was my own personal now as I start to dive into the comps. Let me see if I can get, because much to Timothy's point, you know, if I'm, I'm, it might look like a really good comp, but if it's on the other side of town completely, 
then it has a different value attached to that, right? And I have to, I can use that as a base, but I have to adjust for that much like an appraisal would, right? Is there a minimum number of comps that you would put into the CMA? Um, you know, for, for the CMA itself, not the spreadsheet, for CMA itself, I'd like to see, you know, at least five or six solds. Because I think if you're going under that, you've gotten too tight too fast even, and you're not going to be able to have a good conversation with them. And you might actually want more that are available, maybe not in the CMA, but that are available to talk about. Like in this case, let's assume the price really should have been 650 and they were at 738. I would want to have comps with me that showed why they weren't 738, right? This is, this is why we don't want you at this price. And here's the pictures of the houses to show you why, right? So if I was... If you were on the market against this house as a buyer, would you go to this one or this one, right? Yours or this one? And it starts to put them into reality of, okay, I get that, you know, that I don't, I don't fare well against that competition. And if you were, if you remember, and you probably heard through a lot of the stuff, you know, there's three basic pricing strategies. Do you want to, you know, do you want to be at the market? Do you want to come in at the price where we think you're going to get, you know, do you want to be, Below market, which everybody's doing right now to drive potentially more money in, which is working, it's a strategy that's working very well in today's market. Or do you want to be over the market and test the market, but where we might potentially have to chase the market to get down, you know, to get to a good price. And, and again, in this market, that typically leads to losing money just because of the mentality of the buyers at this stage, right? And you let them decide. Ultimately, they are going to decide what price. You do not want to be chosen to be the agent of choice because of the price you gave them. You should be you should be the agent of choice based on your skills, your expertise, what you've shown them, and then as a consultant, you're working with them to say, and I used to say this, so based on what we've talked about, what I showed you with the comparables, what price do you want me to list your house at? Right? And well, they say... I'm sorry, what other terms um, we, we use for over us, I mean, over the market or at market price or under is the wholesale, retail, and something. No, like? no, I, I just use. Okay. I don't like to use those kind of terms. Okay. Not, yeah. Okay. Sorry for interrupting. No, 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 you're fine. You're fine. Before I forget. You're good. And by the way, if any of you want a copy of the recording just to go back through stuff, I'm happy to send you the link for that. I'm not going to put it on the public access, but we can do. We can set it up with a private link. So. Helpful. Yeah. Do you have, I know it. Well, so again, uh, just very quickly on the closed contract piece, because it's an important piece and it's where, again, a very high percentage of agents fall down. They don't ever ask for the contract, right? And so when you walk in, I want you to remember it's yours to lose. And don't think you have to get through the whole presentation to get a contract. If you walk around the house and you've had a good conversation and they start saying, okay, yeah, so if we, you know, let's get this listed and you can line up your painter and stuff. Stop talking, <laughs> pull out the contracts. That's where a lot of agents make a big mistake. Yeah, Just go say, okay, let's take a look at the pricing so we can figure out how you want me to put this on the market for pricing, right? Go into that, everything should be that assumptive close. I prefer, again, have the contracts, you can put them in front of them. Uh, if you read a lot of the sales techniques, you have sometimes you have to get to so many no's before you get to the yes, right? So you flush them out. I used to pull that contract out at different stages. I get back to the table after the walkthrough. Okay, so you're ready to sign the contract so we can talk about your marketing strategy and how we're gonna price it. Some people would sign it. Some people would go, well, no, we wanna hear what you do first. Great, put the contract over there. Okay, so here's how we would market the property. So you're ready to sign the contract, right? It's like, it, it's a, it's, it's your, you'd be surprised how fast I got out of some houses. Right? But I used to show up at the front door and say, hi, I'm Paula Kowalczyk. Berkshire Hathaway Home Services Commonwealth, I believe you were expecting me and I'm excited to be here tonight so we can get your house on the market. Or I can get your house on the market, right? I mean, I went right with it and I let them say no to me because most times they won't. Okay? You guys did a good job. I think you flushed out some good holes. That's what this is all intended to do. Where can I go back? Where can I do better? Where can I add to my materials? This is, you know, you're all at different levels. So this is a little further along. Timothy's a little further along than some of you, but you saw how she showed up prepared. Without a doubt, that's how you should be showing up prepared at a minimum, right? And she knows she's got stuff to go add just to get even that little bit better. Don't be afraid to keep working on your own expectations of what you can deliver. We can always do better. 
We can always refine. We can always step that up a notch. All right. Go put those listing contracts on the on the calendar.